Hello there, it's Andy Parks from the Washington Times, and welcome back. It's time for the Wacky News of the Week. Well, not all of it's wacky. Wait a minute, if Democrats are involved, it is wacky. That and a look at the latest in Ukraine with Washington Times reporter Ben Wolfgang coming up. But first, as a listener to my podcast, you qualify to receive a 50% discount on an annual digital subscription to the Washington Times. Simply go to WashingtonTimes.com slash Andy. That's WashingtonTimes.com slash A-N-D-Y. All right, where to begin? Hmm, why not Hillary? Turns out she and her campaign cronies are the bad guys for spying on Donald Trump all along. Even some Democrats ran away from her after hearing the news, some even saying that she did them a favor she won't be running for president in 2024. But wait, special counsel John Durham was fine with the Democrats before the findings, and now the left is attacking him because of what he found. Yes, I don't see any apologies from the left-wing media either. Where is Leslie Stahl? Remember, she was relentless in her interview with Donald Trump, claiming that CBS didn't report on stories they couldn't verify. Yet she tore into him when he said he was being spied on. Yes, she didn't verify that story. Trump was right, she was wrong, period. By the way, she would have never disrespected any other president the way she did Trump. People like George Stepan Olibus of ABC conveniently didn't report on Durham's findings. NBC, CBS, the same way. CNN, barely a mention. It's very sad. The Super Bowl was this past weekend, and that means VIPs, Hollywood types, J-Lo, Ben, Charlize Theron, sports stars like... LeBron James, even L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti, all getting together without masks at their own stadium party. That's right, a big super spreader party at the Super Bowl. Another case of rules for thee, but not for me. They all broke the mandate for masks, yet the mayor, the guy who is responsible to enforce that, wore no mask and had a good old time. That's hypocrisy at the highest level. All right, folks, let's check in with Washington Times, Pentagon, military, and foreign affairs reporter Ben Wolfgang. We'll get the latest on the Ukraine fiasco. Hi, Ben. Good morning, Andy. How you doing? Doing just fine. Biden takes wait-and-see approach as Russia says some troops are pulling back. So perhaps some good news related to our problem child, Vladimir Putin? <laughs> To some degree, I think, yes. I think Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, sort of marked a little bit of a turning point from where we were over the weekend, where, where the warnings that we were getting from the administration, the State Department, the intelligence community had really just reached a fever pitch, where you had the embassy essentially being evacuated and now moved uh, to western Ukraine, troops being moved out of Ukraine who had been there for, for drills. Things looked pretty dire, you know, Saturday and Sunday. Now, yesterday, we got a little bit of a glimmer of hope with Russia saying that it's ending some of its military exercises in Belarus and Crimea and pulling some troops, some of the, you know, 150 some odd thousand troops they have along the Ukrainian border. They're going to start pulling some of those back. So I think what you saw President Biden do yesterday was try to sort of, if there's a crack in the door, he tried to essentially, you know, run through it, try to get as much daylight as he could through that potential crack in the door uh, toward peace and away from war. But the problem is, as we've seen, and as Biden even said yesterday during his address at the White House, Russia's words and actions, as we've seen plenty of times in the past, are often two very, very different things. And that seems to be the case, at least to some degree here. They're saying the right things, that they're ending drills and pulling troops back and sort of trying to de-escalate this crisis. But near as I can tell, and what we're hearing on the ground and, and from U.S. and NATO sources overnight and into this morning, not a whole lot of evidence that that's actually the case. Uh, when you look at satellite imagery and, and firsthand accounts from the front lines, not a whole lot of movement of the Russian troops. So it remains to be seen. I think the next 24, 48 hours is is going to be crucial. Refresh my memory again. Why is Putin trying to grab Ukraine to begin with? You know, it's a fantastic question. And depending on who you talk to, you're going to get 
some different answers here. I, I think the simplest answer is, you know, this this sphere of influence idea. And we're seeing this both from from China and from Russia over the past 10 years, increasingly with China, of course, in in their part of the world. But Putin wants to have a quote unquote sphere of influence. He's got great influence in Belarus, as we've seen. He's got some great influence uh, in parts of Central Asia, Kazakhstan, for example, some of those countries. Uh, the U.S. is trying to base counterterrorism assets in those countries to help out in Afghanistan. And Russia essentially is able to block that because of the economic and social power that it has over some of those countries. So Putin wants that sphere of influence to extend to Ukraine. That was the reason for the, the military annexation of Crimea. Uh, we saw that even with Georgia, uh, you know, going back to the, the late uh, 2000s, uh, you know, more than a decade ago with the, the invasion of parts of Georgia by Russian troops. So Putin doesn't like that Ukraine and Georgia are essentially drifting closer to the West. Uh, they're not members of NATO, but they're unspoken understanding that they're on a track toward NATO membership at some point in the future. Putin doesn't like that. So that's kind of one idea is that Putin wants to just retain greater influence over Ukraine. And he feels like that's slipping away. And military action is one way to try and get it back. The bigger picture goal, I think here, and I think Putin's probably actually having more, a little bit more success with this than he is with Ukraine specifically, is to divide the West, to divide NATO. Now, and we saw this uh, a few weeks ago where, you know, Germany essentially seemed to be kind of, you know, singing from a different hymnal, if you will, with respect to the U.S. and other NATO members in terms of what kind of sanctions we're going to put in place. Where does Nord Stream 2, how does that play in to this whole situation? There was some division. That was being so, you know, we got he got President Biden to come out and say that we're not going to put U.S. troops in Ukraine to fight Russia. That in and of itself, I think, was something of a win for Putin to at least get that publicly on the record that Ukraine essentially would be on its own when it comes to the actual fighting. So I think what he's tried to do, and he's had some success, but not as much as he would like, is to divide NATO and to sort of use Ukraine as, as a cudgel to hit the West and, and try and deepen whatever cracks into and finally today, the amazing bubblehead from New York, AOC, blames the high crime surge in New York City on the child tax credit expiring. What? She's a big defund the police liberal, and a very stupid one at that. She and the squad have about $300,000 in protection provided to her by us, so she's got nothing to worry about. Her attitude and other Democrats like her forced House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to say that the Democrats are not the defund the police party and never were. She lied again. And once again, I spit my coffee across the room when she said it. What a liar. Thanks for joining me today. And remember to receive a 50% discount on an annual digital subscription to the Washington Times. Go to WashingtonTimes.com slash Andy. You'll get 24-7 digital access to the Washington Times at 50% off. Again, go to WashingtonTimes.com slash A-N-D-Y. I'm Andy Parks. Have a great day.